talk about a little bit about what you think uh, digital resilience is and, and give a bit of an explanation. With regards to resiliency, uh, that's always been F5's DNA from day one. Uh, when we started back in 95, when the company was founded, um, it was around the ability to provide very high scalability, um, self-healing capability for gaming at that point in time. Um, but it has evolved now to enterprises and uh, that's what resiliency means, uh, zero downtime, high availability. At the same time, um, the, uh, the other part of the DNA that came across was the security part. Uh, in, you know, when, when you do resiliency, you have to put some sort of uh, ability to protect yourself from attacks. So, so application security become a natural extension to that resiliency. Yeah. So AI, in my own sense, I, I felt that it is actually the kind of automation that helps to increase productivity. Um, that's the general sense that we are getting from AI into this context. What do you think some of those key challenges are at the moment around digital resiliency? So I think if you look at from aspect of AI, like I said, AI is not new. Yeah. Right? AI has been around and different aspects of it. So a lot of the challenges a lot of organizations are facing with AI is around how you actually deploy it, how you want to operationalize it, and how you actually even recruit people. So the challenges are not just about systems, but it's about system, the process, the people, the whole nine years with it. So as organizations look at it, one of the biggest concerns people look at AI and they're starting to realize it is cost. Mm. Things like training a model, one-time cost. But being able to do inference and deploy that model at scale or over a long period of time, the cost do know the NVIDIA share price has gone up, but that's because again, it's in demand and organizations want the flexibility as well. I may be able to get NVIDIA GPUs on the cloud. I may want to get them on-prem. I've also got Intel, I've got AMD and other GPU manufacturers coming in as well. So being able to develop and deploy and operationalize the AI at a reasonable cost to the, with respect to the business, I think is one of the biggest challenges. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges. The explosion of data, of course, um, I, I, I would not go too deep into it. Um, everybody understands the, the importance of data. Um, but what is um, more interesting is um, the pandemic actually have a very big paradigm shift um, in uh, pushing and driving digital innovation uh, transformation. Today, consumers and our customers um, have um, are spoiled for choices, right? Um, in the platform that they wish to deploy. Um, in fact, if you look at um, during the pandemic, right, uh, in six months, we actually um, advanced or accelerated digital transformation that we haven't been able to do for the last five or 10 years. Um, so uh, customer has a lot of choices to operate in different platforms. Uh, we are talking about on-premise, uh, different flavors of hypervisors, uh, going to the cloud, um, containerization and etc. Right. The good thing about that is um, now we can find purpose-built platform suitable for each and each business uh, what they really need. Um, but on the flip side, what we are seeing is uh, it becomes very difficult to manage, uh, especially in um, in 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 uh, multiple dimension um, environment where the backup strategy would differ from one over the other, right? Um, and how do they rationalize and harmonize um, the strategy, right? Uh, from a data resiliency perspective, um, how, how do I have a view over everything else? How do I recover in a time of disaster? How do I uh, make sure that um, there's, there is governance, there's compliance in every part of the platform that they are deployed in. So I guess that is one of the biggest challenge. And if I can add, um, AI has also brought in a different um, facade to the whole environment today, right? Um, I was just having lunch with one of the global CIO for one of the global company in the private sector. Um, what he understands is the bad actors today are having more success than usual because they leverage on AI as well, right? They use AI to guess the password, um, to, to impersonate personas and et cetera. Um, gaining access um, in matters of weeks or months, right? Um, compared to, you know, um, 
you know, very targeted attack where they, they talk about years to get into really secure environment. So, so that's an interesting topic because uh, if someone were to ask me that question 10 years ago, right, they, digital resiliency would center around a lot on maybe data uh, integrity within the array, uh, assuming if like this fails, controller fails, that, that's how people looked at resiliency then. Uh, maybe in terms of uh, rack failures, how do you fail data over multiple racks or alternate racks of storages? And in case of 911, you know, when the whole data center goes down, people talk about replicating data across different data centers, right? Um, and bringing it up in the shortest possible time with no impact to the business. But if you look at digital resiliency today, um, people, there's another aspect because of ransomware attacks. Mm -hmm. So how do you keep your data safe in addition to hardware failure, site failures, right? So, so that gives a different perspective on how people should uh, look at securing the data as well, even at the storage level. Yeah. So, so from us, the way we look at it in terms of digital resiliency, in, in addition to hardware and site uh, failures, how do you protect the data? So we take a holistic approach in terms of how do we identify, defend, and uh, restore fast enough with minimal impact to the business. I guess with all new technologies, uh, the key challenges um, always surface at the point of adoption, right? And what we are seeing in the market today is that, you know, companies who want to adopt AI, right, they are looking for technologies that could help them in terms of cybersecurity space, um, looking for technologies that they can help to mitigate threats and uh, increase their security postures, right? They also look at ways as to how they want to do more automation, uh, these are the more repetitive tasks that is boring down, bearing down on their productive, uh, on their workforce. And they want to increase the visibility because end of the day, uh, what they are facing in today's landscape is that they all have very silo tools in managing their identities, uh, their access, and the entire governance aspect. So they don't have a good way to actually have the full visibility across all the different spectrums of the identities uh, that they need to secure in the landscape, right? And, and with that, the challenge is always about how do we then look at the AI technologies that cybersecurity companies provide as a good tool, right? So what is the baseline, right? Mm -hmm. There is no baseline to talk about, right? Because there's no standards to begin with. Every company is coming out with its own variant of AI-based technologies that can help companies to secure. So the vast amount of information and knowledge that the, um, that the companies need to go through in order to decide what's best for them, uh, I think that's the biggest challenge that they have today. You know, there's a lot of challenges today when you know, customers are adopting multi-cloud or hybrid cloud. Um, the, the way you manage your on-prem is very different to how you would manage the, uh, the cloud. And, and quite often our customers have to set up different teams, right? To manage different clouds even. And I think resiliency uh, today has uh, taken, well, the public cloud has high resiliency, you know, they have their own self-healing capabilities as well, but they do go down. <laughs> now and then they do go down. And But if you are operating a, um, an online service that's mission critical, like banks and so on, you tolerate zero downtime, then how do you uh, prevent yourself being a, a single point of failure in a sense, like if you're with one public cloud, then it's a single point of failure still. Um, how, how do you make it so that it can self-heal itself and uh, the same app perhaps is available in another site, perhaps on-prem or in another cloud, and that the network knows how to heal itself and get the users to the right places. Yeah. And on the inverse of, uh, obviously, of uh, the challenges, what are some of the good opportunities with digital resilience? There is always two sides to the coin, right? Um, so with, 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 with the choices that the consumer has, uh, with the technology on hand, um, then from a data protection perspective or a, a vendor who is providing technology to ensure that the community is safe, uh, we can also leverage on what is good, right? Um, specifically, you see, we, we, we can today deploy natively and understand natively in various platform from on-premise to the cloud uh, that helps with the customer on the recovery. Um, and, you know, just, just to make sure there's no data loss. Um, and same thing uh, from an AI perspective, right? Um, we are also, you know, uh, going into this space where uh, we can leverage AI um, to do assisted recovery, uh, you know, forensic, and even, you know, um, just just 
detection of anomaly, right? And that's already in place. And we're going to see more advanced features that's coming out. So yeah, um, that 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 is an exciting arena that we're going into today. And uh, I'm very excited to see what, what, what will unfold next. Would you say that's you know, what robust data management procedures kind of do for cybersecurity to help with cybersecurity? Yes, it, it does, right? So um, imagine this, right? Um, I will use this analogy, right? Uh, you will always have your parameter defense. And uh, at Veeam, we don't profess to be a security expert, but we are always a last line of defense, right? Um, regardless of the lock that you put in, the CCTV, you know, intrusion detection and et cetera, um, if you are targeted uh, one way or another, you can be breached or you will be compromised. And it's a matter of time and how, how high value you are, right? Um, but coming down to um, your most prized jewel, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where do you secure it? Is it in the vault? Is it in the safe? Uh, do you put it in the safe deposit box in the bank? Um, and how does the bank secure it? I guess um, that is how we will see ourselves. Uh, we, we, we want to make sure that the crown jewel of the company, which is data, uh, is protected. Even in the event that you're compromised, right? Uh, you have the ability to recover, right? Or you know, reduce the damages that is being caused. It has been around. So whether it be predictive, et cetera, it has been around for very, very long. And a lot of organizations in Singapore have been on the AI journey for a very long period of time. Yeah. What Gen AI has done, which is what the flavor of AI that's out there at the moment, is a key difference with it is the fact that now you can speak in English to your computer or to the AI engine. Previously, I had to code. I mm -hmm. needed to know Python. I needed to know R. I needed to know a specific language to be able to communicate. But now... With the whole concept of Gen AI, it has now become easy for a end user to be able to converse with an AI engine. So what that means is that the whole piece of AI, it's an overused word, democratization of AI, but it has become a lot simpler to get a lay person to be able to build or use an AI engine. So the use cases are multiple. Mm -hmm. It could be as simple as customer service. How do you interact with the customers, be able to deliver knowledge or even services or just just general information quickly and easily but it could be also be how you automate your systems and processes behind it right so i think it is a game changer in the fact that it has made it a little easier to adopt but the challenges are still there but it just become a bit more easier to deploy for the business itself those key opportunities that at least from what cyber Arc can look at is uh in terms of different areas so one of the key things that we are looking at is, uh, of course, from the access standpoint. So how can we provide dynamic policies okay, that can help in securing these identities uh, by taking in feeds from the user activities and the behaviors, all right? And then to decide what's best for them and implementing the least privileged controls that we, we can provide um, in securing organizations today, right? So this is the opportunity that we work in. Um, the second opportunity that we see today that's very relevant is um, the advancement of AI assistance, mm. right? Because gone are the days where you actually need technical language to write out something, you know, in order for chatbots and uh, assistants to, to, to respond. So right now, the shift is actually towards using natural language, English, all right? By a way of telling AI saying that, hey, AI, I need to do this. Can you do this for me? Right. We have seen the advancements of how Alexa or this works in that space. So the same is to be said when we are looking in the AI adoption in the cybersecurity space. Right. Uh, last but not least, to improve the threat intelligence that we see today, because there are so many different feeds and information putting in to the system. Right. Someone or some advanced technologies has to be there to make sense of it. All right. And able to do that automation and the detection aspect, and that's to help um, organizations in securing their um, assets at the end of the day. So of course, it opens up a, a wide range of uh, opportunity for tech yeah. companies <laughs> in terms of cyber protection, in terms of uh, you know solutions that can help you with high availability, quick, fast restore. So definitely a big opportunity for us uh, tech solution providers in the market today. And then with that, I guess in cybersecurity, what, you know, what ways does robust data management help with cybersecurity and as, as a benefit? Again, like um, coming from a storage uh, point of view, right? Like cybersecurity is a big topic. 
ranging from different aspects, uh, you know, from endpoint protection all the way to the infrastructure. Uh, we do our part uh, to, to kind of like be the last line of defense for enterprises. So in case the data gets compromised, it gets encrypted, you know, step one, how do you identify that the threat has come in during anomaly detection natively from the storage to complement whatever cyber sol solutions that you have? Number two, once you have identified, how do you protect by having immutable snapshots, for example, that cannot be encrypted? And the third thing, even if you have uh, data to be restored, can you do it fast enough? So the way Pure addresses this problem is during these three steps. So I think recently, in fact, just uh, last month, uh, uh, MAS, Monetary Authority of Singapore, yep. uh, came out with a uh, notice to all the banks there that um, the uh, uh, within the 12 months period, there can only be five minutes of uh, downtime. Okay, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, five minutes, it's not a long time when <laughs> you think yeah, about it. it pretty much, yeah. uh, human would not be able to respond so fast, right? If there is an outage, uh, you need to be able to make the system uh, recognize it and, and self heal itself to meet the 12, uh, five minutes. Um, I think customers are rec uh, starting to recognize that these are uh, mission critical apps that you need to um, make it um, not just user friendly, but always available. Uh, but to do that in a multi cloud world is very, very challenging. Can you think about the day two operations, for example, um, to be able to monitor all healthy different parts of the application? It's just extremely challenging. I think what F5 has uh, been trying to solve is to make, we, we call it, make it ridiculously easy. Yeah. Uh, so that all these different sites don't look like different sites. They look like overall it's the same site. Um, uh, and you manage it with the same construct, the same definition. And that makes the operation team to, to be consolidated to one team instead of one team per site or yeah. one team for AWS, one team for Azure. Now we can have one team for all of that and on-prem. And what would you say um, is the main contributor of that strong data governance towards cybersecurity as well or robust data management? Yeah. So data management has always been a key issue. Um, you know, when you think about uh, the, you know, if I if I may, uh, I know AI is, is uh, such a hot topic, uh, uh, yeah. but I, I just want to bring up the concern around AI, especially with the more recent, um, you know, emergence of uh, RAG, which is um, uh, uh, the augmented uh, uh, retrieval of information. Now with RAG, what it means is that now you're plugging uh, LLM, large language model, to multiple data sources. And each data source, you think about it today, let's say SharePoint, um, ERP, or CRM, each of these have their own uh, access control. But if you plug in an LLM to these three data sources and you, you let the LLM go and you know uh, learn the data and, and make sense of it, then effectively you've broken all the access control that was implemented pre previously in each of these data sources. So then how do you maintain that same level of access control, data security, data protection, now at the large language model, when now uh, a user who's accessing the large language model, who may not have access to, let's say, ERP, but because LLM is connected to ERP, it's able to retrieve information that he shouldn't be able to see. So those are the complications, that I think, um, in terms of data security that needs to be uh, looked at. And for F5, we, we recognize this up early and that we are looking at you know, implementing like a technology called AI Gateway to address this. Because if you think about application security, we've been doing that with, let's say, web app, application firewall, the WAF. Yeah. So a WAF will protect a web app or an API. But now for LLM, AI, you need to have an AI Gateway. So equivalent of a Waffle web app is an AI gateway for an LLM to do the same level. What do you think some of the core ethical challenges that we need to, to worry about or to, to focus on as well of AI? As with AI, because they are ingesting huge amounts of data, privacy is actually the first major concern, right? Because how do we ensure that customer sensitive data is not being extracted, being mined, and um, being used in other purposes, what is not meant to be, right? That's the first and foremost consideration. The second, what we also encounter is the biasness, right? <laughs> because today, AI is training from models, right? So whatever data has been trained from the model suspect, there could be an element of biasness towards certain groups or certain functionalities. 
uh, they may affect the outcomes or the recommendations that it makes, right? And third, definitely is accountability, right? Because you're getting AI to do the recommendation or even to automate the action, the response. So how do you really account um, who's right or whose responsibility is it to actually ensure that the actions taken is actually legit and approved, right? So these are the three major ethical implications that I actually see in the market today. I think the biggest barrier to a lot of organizations deploying, especially Gen AI, is the whole ethical and the governance piece of it. The reason why, I mean, all of us came across OpenAI last year. It's been around a bit earlier than that, but most of us saw it burst into the market. And when we burst in the market, a lot of organizations were very eager to do it. That's when you, everyone started realizing the ethical issues behind it, right? So what does your bot, for example, respond? Mm -hmm. How does it affect your share price? Many organizations have seen early deployments go south because either a chat engine gave a wrong answer to a price of a product, uh, dished out the wrong image because of something uh, someone asked for. So there are a lot of challenges with it. So being able to manage uh, or gov have a proper governance model on the piece of how you respond, uh, what you respond, and how this engine is predictable. So explainable AI, ethical AI, all of this fall into this big umbrella that I generally call AI governance. Yeah. Okay. So it is the biggest stumbling block for organizations to be able to mitigate the risks associated with Gen AI. It's not about people losing jobs. It's about how do you actually manage the risks associated to your business? So cybersecurity and, and resilience has become a big thing, probably of latter times, right? Yes. So, and I think the convergence with artificial intelligence has made it really a bit more important now as well, because things That's can right. happen. Right. And probably even quantum computing as it comes on is yeah. going to make it even harder. What are some of your future predictions for what, you know, what we will need to do or what are things we need to concern ourselves with or prepare ourselves for? Yeah, so I mean, topic of AI, Gen AI is a big topic nowadays. Uh, in the end, it's a very powerful tool. It can help us do a lot of good. And if people have not so good intentions, do a lot of, uh, uh, cause more inconvenience to enterprises as well. So um, definitely to, to, to be prepared against uh, such attacks will be important. And uh, I think that's why as a company, as we evolve um, as an organization, um, putting solutions in that addresses all these uh, issues uh, is a key design principle. For, for us nowadays? I think digital resilience uh, has to mean that, um, you know, that your service always up 24 by seven. Um, and the, the team that's operating it needs to be able to provide, uh, at least have observability what's going on. Um, some of these, uh, the, what we call uh, service level indicators, service level objectives need to be visible, right? Um, not just from the infra, but from the applications, from the data, um, how, how things are operating. And, and only with that in place, then you can put in the policies of how it's going to self-heal itself, how it's going to be able to react to um, outages or you know, uh, misbehaviors in, in certain systems. Um, so, so those things are what we you know, commonly call um, SRE, Site Reliability Engineering where you basically operate the whole infra, the app as one team, right? And, and then you can make the uptime uh, possible. In fact, um, Vim just um, say three months ago, uh, signed a very strategic um, alliance agreement with uh, Microsoft um, to co-develop, co-pilot, right? Um, and integrate that into Vim, right? Um, that is just one, one, one area that we are going into. And uh, just two months ago, during our flagship event at VimOn in uh, Florida, uh, we actually see in action, right? Uh, AI-assisted uh, forensic, AI-assisted recovery, uh, behavioral-based um, um, actions, right? And outcomes and et cetera. Um, so we're going to see a lot uh, of um, AI-assisted um, uh, technology that will come forward um, from analytics to um, performing uh, actual recovery or even uh, threat assessment. So yeah, that, that is where I see in the near future we will be going. Um, and along with the AI, we are going to produce a lot more data and yeah, we will have to find a better way to rationalize how we 
we protect this data because this will be your crown jewel eventually. Consider as well as how we balance AI with digital resilience. So how would you suggest we, we do that? Well, the challenge is always at the end of the day, how do you want to balance uh, the adoption of AI, treading in carefully into the productivity and also company policies, right? Uh, you cannot go as a whole big bang approach. Uh, I mean, that will simply overwhelm and then, you know, raise objections by, uh, objections will be raised by everyone. Um, now, you also need to provide a means for anyone to say, I want to be excluded if I want to. You need to give the choice, all right? And, and that's how we are also doing it in our products today, when we have actually AI infused elements in the product features. And if customers say that, I, hey, look, I, I don't want that, I'll, I'll let you opt out of it. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where the balance has to be treaded carefully and giving some controls back in terms of the actions to be taken by individuals. That will help to ease, I feel. Cybersecurity, data security, I call them the easy part. Yeah. These are things that you can solve. How do you actually secure data? For example, train your models on public cloud, but refine your models or uh, build new models with using local data there are LLMs, large language models. There are also small language models. Organizations that are able to take small subsets and put them on-prem to be able to run small language models, fine-tuned with your data. Therefore, you can address mm. cyber or data security by taking publicly trained models, refine them using your data on-prem with, with better security within your own uh, four walls and deploy them at the edge. Uh, so being able to deploy at a lamppost, for example. So I, I would say that the cyber and the privacy and the security issue are fairly easier to handle because technology handles it. But the governance piece of it, the kind of answer, the kind of data you're trained on determines how the system is going to respond. So if you put in biased data in your training or there's just bad data, your responses will turn out differently. And that's where the reputational risk or the overall risk to the organization is less of cyber data protection, et cetera. They are there, but I think those are the ones that easily mitigate it. But stuff like governance, for example, they're a lot harder and there are a lot of community projects. So Red Hat being an open source company, we, we focus a lot on the community. So for example, with Singapore government, with IMDA, we joined a foundation called AI Verify. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually test your data? How do you test your models, et cetera? We also work with trusty AI, et cetera, to help organizations build models that are trusted and you have governance frameworks both locally and internationally recognized that you can deploy those models or deploy those systems securely mm -hmm. and with trusted and if you had one word to describe where you see the future of digital resilience is in 10 years time on humans or businesses what would that one word be and why be prepared it's never ending yeah <laughs> So be sure. prepared. It's a very good slogan for uh, <laughs> making sure everything happens. I think yes, yes. Preparation helps you with everything, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. So, so never really just uh, you know, take a back seat. Be always, you know, on the forefront. You know, trying to improve ourselves against yeah. such attacks as they evolve yeah, continuously. I, I would say automation is the way to go. I think that's definitely the what one keyword that we are looking towards on AI in the next ten years or even more. The yeah. automation part, yeah. Yeah, this is a tough one. <laughs> I, yeah, <laughs> I, I was struggling. Um, I, I, if, if there is really one word, I, I will use the word race, right? Um, it's a race. Um, it's a race between the VAC actor and the technology provider like ourselves um, to get ahead of each other, right? It's always a cat and mouse race. Um, whatever um, a technology that the VAC actors could come up with, we have to come up with a better way to secure it. Um, and companies have to understand that um, IT today goes beyond enabler um, productivity. Um, it's about getting keeping the lights on, right? Um, if your environment fails, your business go out of business, right? As in you, you, the lights is off, right? You, you cannot go on. Um, so um, investment into um, keeping the lights on in your environment and ensuring that it's a safe and secure place um, is going to be uh, paramount um, in, in, my, in, my, in my opinion. And uh, even with the technologies that you know, we can innovate, uh, the people and the process has also 
needs to sorry it needs to continue to change right and evolve and therefore i felt that it is a race right the back actor will get better uh it's not going to get easier for us <laughs> on this side um and i always this is what i always tell the team right um it, it's not going to get easier uh we just have to get better ubiquitous ubiquitous yes. yep i think ai will be everywhere yep. you wouldn't see it as ai is is how the man machine interface has changed it'll just be part of every single thing that we do so it will be ubiquitous regardless whether you're doing a banking transaction or yeah talking to your wife about grocery list you'll be all there i think if one word it would have to be self healing yeah yeah self healing i mean i mean there's no way you can meet that 4 minute requirement a <laughs> uh, 5 minute requirement if you have to do some manual intervention to it it has to be able to recognize itself that it's is failing in certain places and how to overcome that yeah, yeah. so system self healing I love that self healing yeah. is such a, a a strong area and something we would all aspire to do. It'd be yeah. absolutely unbelievable if we could get there. Yeah. Fantastic. 